Well, hello and welcome back. This is CSC 111, uh, Chapter 4. This will be YouTube preparation number two. Um, and I'm picking up where we left off, okay, where you can see the query sequence up here. And you can see that you actually have a specific hit. And this is the sort of gestalt or general feel for the distribution of 27 blast hits on a query sequence, right? And you can actually see the decreasing specificity where each of these codes means something, right? So again, this is to help you understand when you get that graphical response, you have a feel for the number of things that look like they might be interesting to look at, okay? Now, there's another way to look at data though, right? And it's always a numeric way to look at data. And what you actually have here are the responses. A typical BLAST output includes a list of database sequences, blah, 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 blah. Okay, note that the best searches are at the top. And let me make sure I highlight that for you. Make sure this, get an interesting color this time. There you go. Let's go with interesting. Note that the best matches at the top of the list have the largest bit scores. Okay. So use scores here, bit scores. Okay. And small E values. So the E value 1 times 10 to the 10th, minus 10th, 1 times 10 to the minus 3 times. These are all pretty small numbers, right? Relatively speaking. Definitely compared to 2 times 10 to the minus 4th, right? Okay. Makes sense. So this is how you get it in. If you had the graphical viewpoint a moment ago, this is what you'd actually see here. Okay. So you're like, well, so how do I begin to actually use all of this stuff? Well, I'll show you. Start putting it together. And what you can see is when you line them up, notice what they did here is the lower part of blast P consists of a series of pairwise seg C uh, alignments. And you can reformat the option so you can actually see who's aligned and who isn't. So you, they selected all of these, okay? And then what they did is they said, show me the alignment, okay? And let me blow this up so you can actually see what they did here. So you can see it inside your textbook as well. And you're going to see here, notice differences there. Notice the carboxy terminus here. There's something interesting going on. Okay, now you don't necessarily know what it is yet. You can see there's a pattern evolving here, and there looks to be maybe something interesting up here, but look at how quickly it degenerates. You have the same methionine up top, but things get weird imme immediately. All this means it may be interesting for you to look at. Okay, you're going to see that there are at least divergent regions within, in this case, protein families, but that's not unexpected. Now, when we actually look at, let's take a look at this whole thing that's beginning to end. Take a look at something when you're, you, you, they've done a search for you here, okay? And you are seeing that you have Homo sapiens, hemoglobin subunit, beta, epsilon 1, mRNA. And what they've done is they've looked for something that's around 816 bases in length, and they have a bit score of about 410, right? And the expected value is 5 times 10 to the minus 113. Now, that's a far, far, far away number from 1, okay? And you can actually see, look, there are 0% gaps. The identities are roughly 78% throughout the entire thing. And when you go through this and you actually looked one by one, you'd be like, hey, these guys have to be similar. But you're going to notice they've highlighted some information for you inside here. Look at the red replacements. And then, you know, obviously I could take something like this and go, hey, is this a conservative replacement? Is this not a conservative replacement? Stuff like that. Okay. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, you know, unfortunately, if I make this bigger or smaller. It looks like they cut off some of the text inside this. Okay. Um, here the human beta globin was used as a query to match against the closely related epsilon. So you use one human to find the epsilon. Okay. And 
this is how you get a feel for when things are working well for you when you're doing these sort of analyses, if that makes sense. Okay. Cool. So what's actually going on? So I'm going to skip over some of the stuff they have inside the textbook about, you know, how is it they came up with the math behind all of this. And I'm going to get to something that looks intrinsically easy to understand. And that is, if you're looking at the probability of being able to see the query sequence to a set of, let me put that, make sure you underline that, Jonathan. Okay, let me, let's not make it so interesting. Just get, there we go. When you're comparing a query sequence to a set of uniform length random sequences, you're going to generate a score that fits an extreme value distribution. Okay, extreme value distribution. And notice it's your query sequence is a specific length against a set length of uniform random sequences. So it could be this length here is your query, and then everything else you're looking at, let's just get some qualities. Let's go like this. Let's imagine you're looking against that, and you're looking against that, and you're querying against each of these. I'm thinking you're getting the point at this point in time, right? Where each of these represent a protein sequence or a nucleotide sequence or whatever, okay? What happens is when you look at the likelihood that you're going to see something looks identical to it, those would be those experiences that happen way out here. Okay. Makes sense. So the likelihood that you actually see something, okay, they're going to give it a, a standard deviation sigma from the x to the mean, which is going to be zeta. Okay. We don't really worry about the z-score stuff inside this class. Okay. But for the normal distribution, the mean is centered at zero here. Happened to my line, my drawing line. It went away. There it is. Okay. And then as you move further and further away, these are the things that become in interesting to actually look at. So big deal. You're like, okay, I've got some numbers I can look at. I've got a pattern I can look at. How do we then actually use this to start designing experiments? Because that's when things get interesting. <clears throat> and you can. I'm going to go right here. I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to go like this. And you're like, okay, I can start. If inside your textbook you're following along, you have RBP4. Who the hell cares what RBP4 is? But I know that if I actually use any one of these search strategies, I can come up with a series of questions. Okay, so let's start with BLAST-P. What other proteins are related to RBP4? And if we use you know, just say expected value scores, you can quickly figure out how close something is. Same thing with nucleotide. Blast X, this is when things get a little bit weird. What is a known protein? What known protein is a lipocalin EST most related to? In fact, he's going to walk you through a series of how you do these. And then you can actually do these modifiable search parameters, right? You can restrict, this, restrict this, the search to a human, a species, or one group, say bacteria. Or you can change the matrices to discover very distant homologs. So imagine, which we've already done inside the lab, you don't even know that's what you've done yet, but this is what you've done. Okay, And then you can change the gap penalties. Now, I tend to stay away from this, right, because the math behind it that's required to explain it is pretty high. But let's just say that you can find homologs for short regions. Okay, oops. For short regions. Let's make sure we have the right color here. Of a protein that are present inside of other pro proteins. Now, this is. This could be dangerous, right? Because you could go looking for what's the shortest region you know, of some interaction that looks the same. Think about it like, like this. You have um, brothers and sisters inside of a room, and let's say there are five brothers and sisters, and let's say we start off with, hey, which ones all have curly hair? You know, three out of the four have curly hair. 
which ones have blue eyes? Okay, four out of the four have blue blue eyes. Which ones have a flat nose? None of them have a flat nose. Okay, so you, all these different characteristics are short regions, but you could spend the entire time missing the whole point that, hey, they're all part of the same family. Does that make sense? Because once you actually have these different pieces of modifiable information, look at what you can actually do with it, which is where we're going next, right? And that is, okay, and by next, I mean this is your research projects, okay? Find other proteins or genes that are clear related, clearly related to RBP4. Find other proteins that are distantly related, okay? So on and so forth. And then what's going to happen is we finish off the semester. We're only a few chapters away at this point in time. Well, we're going to look at multiple sequence alignments and or create a phylogenetic tree. And <clears throat> no and or, it is what you're doing. You're creating a phylogenetic tree and figuring out how to do that requires digging into not only the textbook but also um, how it is that the PubMed site suggests doing it versus the, the veritable jungle of different ways that it can actually be done. Okay. Okay. So what are we going to do here? Let's do this. Skipping ahead a couple pages inside your text. This has been a midterm exam question that's gotten interesting answers over the years, right? <clears throat> and that has been using this figure. What I've done is I've designed the a specific question to say, hey, can you go through all of these and then actually detect the many HIV pole variants using BLAST-P, looking at bacterial proteins, T-BLAST-10, looking at bacterial ge genomes. Notice what's happening is you're changing the slight search parameters to give you then the interesting, if you look at here, say one human EST, and you do a T-blast X on viral genomes. Think about what T-blast X meant, right? You could come up with a million things here, but it's a minimum of 36 different searches throughout different gene databases to end up with either human, simian, or ovine viruses. So this is a fascinating question. So let's spend a minute or so thinking about it, right? And by a minute, I mean I could put in any protein here or I give you any uh, accession number and then ask you to do this for any of a series of uh, parameters, right? And that's completely legitimate. And what you want to do is you want to figure out or start thinking about how you're going to report that information back to me. Because what you're given is things that look like this. Okay, let's go like that. Okay, first here, this is the first response, right? So there's that top line across the top. And you can see that at least for some of your searches, you got things that look almost identical. And then what's interesting is how are they slightly different? And what are they if they're just only slightly different? And what would that actually have to do with their function? That's a little bit above our pay grade at this point in time, but you could imagine, considering what we're thinking about now, I gave you that coronavirus paper, you could see that we could do this looking at specific sequences within the coronavirus itself, and you should be able to come up with a map that looks something similar to this. Not that you will, not that you won't, okay? Maybe you do that on your own time, Okay, but it's interesting now you have the basic tools in place to ac actually do that. Now, if that's the visual response, remember, there's a numeric response. And to make sense of this, I'm sorry, we have to blow this way up. Okay, and take a look at some of the ex expected values for what we just saw. So the reason why they're all red is take a look at the expected value here. It's minus 159 or minus 153 or minus... 148. These are pretty much at least that segment of the um, sequence that was used as our query pretty much got us everything. Now notice that these are vertebrates. What happens when we come down here to say, let's go yeast, okay, or we go wild boar, or we go Oh, I don't even know what this is. Flower beetle. Okay, this is a, an insect, right? Notice what's actually happened to the scores versus what we saw up here. Okay, so using these sort of visual cues, the E values and hits, okay, um, you 
begin, I'm hopefully seeing, or hopefully I will see on your exams, the ability to sort of tease out significant sort of responses. Okay, let's turn that back to where it was. Yay. So let's jump to the end here, because okay, so the next two slides, I'll use those if you have questions. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how do you discover a novel gene using blast ser searching? Right. So here's a flow chart, and uh, this is a great thinking paradigm. Okay, start with a known sequence, search what you want to look for, inspect the output, then make your decisions. Okay, is it novel? Is it not, not novel? And then you can continue moving through this. Um, it depends. I mean, a lot of this depends on, on how creative you actually are as a person, right? And if we look here, you're going to see that, blow this up a little bit, sometimes sometimes the E value is a great way to go. Okay. You're going to so it's here, minus 44, minus 97. You can see that if you actually look for something, it looks pretty straightforward. Okay. This was beta globin. Take a look at find a gene project. Okay. They work, they work through the different steps here. They came up with something that looks like it's pretty new. And that's interesting because before they did this, I think it was one of his students who actually did, did, did this, they hadn't actually seen a nematode globin before. So this is actually how they went about finding the nematode globin. So when you're reading chapter four, you're thinking to yourself, these are the tools that I need to discover new things inside of this class. And that's what each of you will be doing before, you know, for your final exam project. Okay. So I'm hoping you sort of enjoyed chapter four. I know there's a lot of math inside of it. I'm definitely a little bit less math than chapter three, but try and stay away from the understanding how the matrices are made and all of that. But think to yourself, how did we actually get to an expect value? What does the score value and bit value actually mean? And then sort of inside the back of your mind, you're always thinking of these tools and these tools are, do I have a visual representation? sort of similar to, so these are the, let's go here. Remember I said I'd try to explain this with you. This is the visual presentation here where they're looking at the HIV scores and they keep looking and they actually see that you can break down different domains of HIV to specific responsibilities. So if that's the entire genome or protein structure, depending on what they're looking at, right? It looks like these are proteins, right? And you can actually see that there are regions within them that have spe specificity that are, you know, you need to be able to look at this and go, look, okay, I can see the general idea here. Okay. And notice some of them are specific to bacterial. Okay. If these are bacterial and this is our human, there's something going on there. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. Okay. And then this would be the blast P of HIV-1 against human non-redundant protein database. So non-redundant, meaning not copied. You can see a distinct pattern going on here. And then T-blast-N, if you remember what T-blast-N was, the nucleotide search, right, where it's being translated into six frames. And the reason why you do that with viruses, of course, they actually use most of their reading frames, whereas we don't necessarily do that, okay? You can actually see a pattern emerge here immediately. Okay. Now, what that pattern means to you, you might need to do some digging to figure it out, but take a look at the scores. There's something interesting going on here in terms of values. Okay. So that's two sets of these to explain chapter four to you. And um, I'm hoping you listen to both of them in their completeness. I mean, what I've learned is students are like, oh my God, I can't stand the sound of his voice anymore. Believe me, I'm with you. But there's, you know, in this in day and age, uh, there's probably no better way to get this information to you. So pe please pay attention to these. Think to yourself, hey, I know I'm getting a midterm exam on Thursday, and he's going to ask me some of this stuff. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Okay, be safe. Take care. Bye.